Здравствуйте, товарищи. We're back with day four. Today we're learning Russian handwriting. So now that we've mastered the print version of the alphabet, we're learning how to actually write it. And uh, I would take this lesson really seriously, especially since the uh, sort of idea behind this entire course is that your goal is to really master Russian uh, and using it, use it in a meaningful way, right? Not just order some drinks at a bar or something like, you know, tourist Russian. Right. We want to really uh, learn Russian in a lot of depth, and part of that means learning how to write Russian properly and also how to read handwritten Russian. So Russians, I would say, use cursive uh, much more commonly than we probably tend to anymore in the U.S. at least, where we probably learn how to write cursive at some point in school but aren't necessarily held to any particular standard or expected to write uh, you know, properly uh, thereafter. Right, so um, we probably use some highly personal version of, a, of the print alphabet. Now in Russian, it's a little more standardized, right? So Russians learn how to write this way in school, and what we're teaching today is more or less that version that they learn. Uh, of course, there are always some variations, right? A, a given letter may have a few different, slightly different versions, but more or less, this is the way most Russians are going to write. Um, and in my classes, right, I insist that, Russian, that uh, students do all their written work using cursive instead of just making something up, right? So um, I would really spend a lot of time practicing this. It's really best to learn it just by doing. And most students really don't have a lot of trouble with this, especially, again, if they've learned cursive at, at some point in their uh, school career, then uh, a lot of the same basic principles and even the shapes of a lot of the letters are going to look quite familiar. Um, but you should uh, learn, really take this as seriously as, for example, if you were learning uh, Arabic, and of course part of learning that would have to be learning how to write the Arabic, Arabic uh, cursive script. There would be no way around it. Uh, well, I would say also, too, for anyone serious about Russian, you really need to learn how to write Russian this way. Uh, if only for you know to read handwritten notes you may get from Russians or other situations where handwriting may be used. Uh, one good example is... Um, you know, like daily specials or daily menus list uh, written on blackboards and cafes and things like that. You see this cursive script all the time. And indeed, a lot of uh, printed scripts, you know, like fonts, will be some stylized version of this cursive script. So for all sorts of reasons, it's important to learn this script. And uh, we'll see today again, it's generally quite easy. It's best learned by simply writing out, writing out words. Um, take a few days uh, and I think you'll uh, catch on to it. So our focus today is going to be on um, little mistakes people make that seriously affect legibility. Obviously, you know, any Russian is going to have their own distinct kind of handwriting style. So even though they may stick more or less to what we're learning today, they're going to all do it in their slightly own, you know, Id idiosyncratic way. And that's fine, of course. But uh, there are certain mistakes you can make as a student that will, for example, make one letter that you're trying to write look like a completely different letter and thereby seriously affect legibility, especially if, you, especially if you have two or three of these mistakes within a given word, right? It starts to get very confusing visually. So that's what our focus will be today. Um, so what is the point of cursive? Uh, well, obviously, it's to, to uh, pick up your pen as, as uh, infrequently as possible. So we're trying today, every time we write out a word, to write it out in one complete uninterrupted block and then once we, we've written out the main body of the word, then we probably will pick up our pen and either start the following word, of course, or we'll go back and, so to speak, uh, dot our I's and cross our T's, much like we would in English, right? There are a, little, a few certain things we have to go back and do after we've written out uh, most of the word itself. So let's look at that now on page uh, 16, item 4.2, right? Uh, there are three, or actually four cases where we can go back at the end of a word and add little details. Right, uh, the first one is the letter ikratkaya. Remember, that's our consonant, kind of like the English Y. <coughs> now, in Russian, remember, we have E at the vowel, and then we have ikratkaya, the consonant, right? So we're talking now about ikratkaya, the letter with a little hat. Okay, so we can compare that to an English I, right, where you write the I itself and then you go back and dot the I, so to speak, when you're done writing out the word. Very similar to what we have in, Engl in Russian with ikratkaya. So if we take the word vaina, which means war, vaina, uh, we're going to write it like this. 
Okay, there's the body of the word. Now, of course, we're going to practice these letters more in a moment. Right now, the point is just these, uh, you know, little details. We've written out the word there, and now we need to go back. When we're done writing the word, we add the little hat above the kratkaya, and there's our finished word, vaina. Second letter is the Russian. Again, it looks like an X to us, the kha, right? Now, for this letter, this is actually a good example right off the bat of a letter where there, there is a, a fairly common variation. A lot of Russians will write uh, what in print looks like that. In cursive, they'll write like this. They'll make one backwards loop and then pick up their pen and come back and write the, the second loop. So it sort of looks like two uh, you know, Cs uh, 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 standing back to back. But personally, I learned to write the uh, Russian X, we'll call it differently, right? The Kha. Uh, I learned to write it as a little kind of squiggle like that, which actually itself looks like a Russian G. We're going to learn that in a moment when we look at the entire alphabet. So you write it like this, and then when you're done writing the word, you come back and add a cross stroke there to complete the Kh. Right? Okay, so let's look at an example. Uh, the word plocha, which means bad or badly. If we write out the main body of the word, there it is. So we've done everything except the one thing. We've got to now go back and add the cross stroke to the kha, right? So um, there's our completed word, plocha. Uh, okay, the last item concerns two uh, letters. Uh, Russian te, we know, looks like this in the printed version. And in the cursive version, it looks actually like a, a uh, English cursive M, right? So we're going to see, unfortunately, that once we start using this uh, cursive version of the alphabet, we're going to get new instances of interference, right? So we just have to kind of circle those and take care of not to confuse them. Um, okay, and the next letter is the sh, which in cursive looks like that. So we'll practice that more in a moment. The point now is that um, when you're done writing out a word that includes either of these letters, it's optional to go back and add a kind of crossbar above the ta and uh, under stroke or whatever beneath the sh. Both of these are optional, right? So again, for these two letters, the kratke and the ch, we would need to do something to make sure we complete that letter. These are purely optional, and in some sense, they're sort of decorative, but they also serve a very practical purpose, right? Uh, for one thing, this um, ta, the cross, the uh, Stroke above the letter may help you associate it visually with the printed version of the ta. So this may be especially useful for students, especially at the beginning. Um, let's just take a couple of examples and see why we would do this. Uh, the first example, let's just take a Russian verb like pete, which means to drink. And you see, especially being new to this, that looks a little bit confusing, right? You kind of have a bunch of humps and, you know, mountains and valleys and so forth, and it's hard to distinguish one letter from another. But if we go in now and add the line above the te, then it becomes that much easier to see. This is a pe, i, te, sa, sign. Nyach, iznak, pit, pit. Okay, but maybe even more importantly, there are a number of letters that look a lot like this one. For example, the letter e looks like an English u. Right, so or you, I should say. Okay, so what happens if we have a letter? Let me first write it in print. A word, I'm sorry, like shishka, shishka, which means a pine cone, among other things. Okay, so if we write that in cursive, here's what we're going to get. Okay, so you see at the beginning of this word, we have just a seemingly endless string of absolutely identical strokes. Right, and so visually it can be very hard to, to uh, especially you know if you don't know the word or maybe you don't have any context or anything, what the heck is that word? Well, if we had gone back and put uh, marks beneath the two shas, right? We see it's shishka. It makes it that much easier to discern, to, to kind of disentangle those letters and recognize them and read out the word. So uh, again, these are both optional. But uh, the, the te is, is maybe helpful, at least at the beginning, but the sh is something I think that is extremely useful 
And for me personally, I still write like this. I still write the line beneath the sh, but I don't write the line above the ta. I just don't see any need for it. Uh, but I think this is, is helpful even when you know Russian quite well. It's still just a helpful visual marker. Now, one more thing that this does for us is help distinguish the sh from the double-length consonant sh, right? Remember that letter with the tail in cursive? That's going to look like this, right? We're going to keep that little tail at the bottom, but we would never write a stroke beneath sh, right? We would never do that. So take careful note of that. You'll see it in a moment in the, in the table, the reference table. Right, so if we see this line here, it helps us realize, okay, that's sh, not sh. Okay, so let's move on to page uh, 17, and uh, we see here our reference table. And let's just talk quickly about how to use this. Um, if we, let's start by looking at the letter A, which is a very easy one. And you see that, as is going to be fairly often uh, the case, it looks just like an English cursive A. Right, so very easy to deal with. Now, how do we interpret the guidelines here? Well, we see if we look carefully, there's a little letter one right above it at the top and then an arrow, right? That's just showing you two things. Your first stroke is going to start here and go like this, right? And come up here and then go back down, right? So you see you have a few arrows that are just helping you see the direction of, the, uh, of any given stroke. And since each stroke is numbered, you see there's only a one here. That means this is all written in one stroke, right? It requires only one stroke. Um, whereas a capital B, for example, if you look at the next item, requires two strokes, right? Um, one, the first stroke begins here, uh, but the second stroke starts up here, right? It requires two strokes. Um, okay, let's get rid of that. Okay, what else do we see on the reference table? Little dotted lines, and if we look at the eye, we see three of them. We see one coming up from the baseline like that. We see another up here towards the top, and then we see one trailing off the, the tail there uh, behind the letter A. Now those dotted lines are simply marking sort of the trajectory by which we can connect uh, preceding or following letters, right? Um, so you see that the I is pretty flexible. It can, from, it can join to a letter preceding it sort of from the top or from the bottom, because in any case, we're going to be starting right here, right? So whatever flows into that starting position naturally is no problem. But any letter that comes after the I, we're going to have to start that letter from the bottom, right? Where we naturally would finish making the I. So those are the general uh, principles, right? It, it, uh, I would practice this again simply by writing out words over and over and checking to see just first that the general shape is correct, of course, but then looking in more detail at, um, you know, where can this letter correct and make, connect and make sure you've connected it, connected it uh, to its neighboring letters in a proper way. Again, you'll see very quickly that you don't really need to refer to this table too much because this stuff kind of just takes care of itself, right? If it flows together naturally, go with it. Uh, and then just pay attention to those very special cases we're going to discuss that can cause problems. Okay, so let's look, for example, at the word Bolshoi. And we'll see an example of two letters that just can't uh, join in any logical way. So let's now jump first to the second letter, B. So lowercase B in Russian cursive looks like that. And you can see it's quite unusual. There's nothing like that in English cursive. Uh, but look where we finished writing the ba. And now we look refer to the table. You see we have dotted lines, much like with the a, ah, coming up near the middle, and also from below that we can, uh, you know, connect the ba to the preceding letter at those points. But we finished writing a ba all the way up here. And indeed, if we look at the table, there is no, you know, there's no line of any sort trailing off at the tail end of that ba. And that tells us that B does not connect to a following letter ever. It should never connect. Now, I guess if a Russian's writing really quickly, maybe somehow it could connect, but we should try to avoid that. And so let's write the letter, the word Bolshoi. That would mean that next we have a le the letter O. The following letter is O. Now look where we start writing the O, near the middle of the row. Right, so it's pretty plain that even if the 
you know, blast simply doesn't connect, but even if it did, right, what would we have to, what hoops would we have to jump through to somehow connect that with the or, right? It's completely unnatural. And so we should never uh, kind of press the issue. Just pick up your pen and start a new letter wherever you end, somewhere up here, and you need to start the new letter somewhere down much further, right? Just don't insist on connecting those letters. Now, if we look at Bao Shui, we see three issues, actually. Right? Bao doesn't connect to O. The O, we end that up here near the middle, and now the following letter is L, which starts at the bottom. So those three letters actually don't connect. So we have three issues already. Uh, well, one with each letter. And now we have a, a fourth issue. The sa sign does connect at the bottom, but it doesn't connect to any following letters, right? We, if we find that at the very the penultimate row of the table, we see that the sa sign can connect to a pre preceding letter, but it doesn't connect to a following letter. Okay, why is that so important? Because if we did go and connect this to a following letter, chances are very good that it's going to look like an U, right? That's the form of the, uh, the cursive version of the letter U, right? So again, we've made a little mistake. We've connected a letter that shouldn't be connected. And as a result, it, it looks very much like a different, an entirely different letter. So that's the kind of thing we have to try to avoid today. Anyway, if we finish this word, Ba Shui, there's the finished version, right? We, we wrote out the entire word, then we came back and put the line under the sh, and then put the hat on the ikratkaya. Okay, let's just go through the letters quickly, and I'll write these out. Most of them, again, are very easy. So um, just uh, write them out naturally and uh, follow the general shapes and then as necessary refer to the chart to make sure you know if you're confused about how does this letter connect just check the chart so let's start with ah very easy there's ah now ba uh, a lot of these uppercase letters uh, require two strokes right so we have first this and then we come back and put a sort of hat on top of them uh, using a second stroke. You'll also notice that a lot of the uppercase letters don't connect to the following letter. Now, again, usually it makes perfect sense if we end this capital letter all the way up here, it's very unlikely that we're going to somehow connect that to the following um, lowercase letter. Right now, the lowercase ba looks like this. You might want to practice this one. So I'll, I'll tell you which letters give the most trouble. This lowercase ba is definitely one of them. Um, people often get confused and they want to do something like this, right? So watch carefully how we're forming this letter. It looks really like an a ah, and a. Ah. We start up here, but then instead of you know coming back down to make an a, ah, we just trail off up here and make this rather dramatic uh, stroke at the very top of our uh, row. Um, okay, next letter is V, which looks exactly like the English cursive for B, for, for B, right? The English B. So this presents no problems. And you can see that the uppercase V doesn't connect to the following letter. Okay, G, capital G is, again, consists of two strokes. Make sure that you write it like this. One tendency is to, is to sort of center the second stroke above the lower one, in which case it could look kind of like a T, although as we'll learn later, Russians don't write the uppercase T like this typically. Okay, so you want something like this, G. And then the lowercase G is basically a little backwards S, just a little squiggle like that. And we see if we look at the table that it can connect like this, pretty much as you would expect. Um, so this is a letter that can, uh, since it's unlike anything in English, it can cause a bit of trouble when you're going through, uh, you know, and writing out a word in, in a single flow. So it may take a bit of practice. You might want to circle it. Next letter is D, and uppercase D looks like uh, English uh, uppercase D. But lowercase d looks like a, suspiciously like an English g, lowercase g. 
Okay, so you might definitely want to circle this letter. It's going to be another source of interference, right? And uh, now, um, note that in a lot of italic fonts, we mentioned earlier that you know some uh, fonts look like like a cursive script completely, but even the italic versions of just ordinary print printed fonts like Times or whatever. Um, they may in some cases resemble these cursive versions more than their ordinary uh, non-italic print versions. And this is another example of um, a shape you might see in certain italic alphabets. Okay, let's start with, let's do yeah and your. This is pretty easy. Here's your uppercase and lowercase. Looks just like English E. If you need to make a your, just put your umlauts above it. Now remember that's definitely optional in Russian, uh, but for learning purposes, you might want to add that to your list of things you can do when you're finished writing out a word. So for example, you could write out a word like uh, yours, which means hedgehog, and then go back and write the little umlaut above the, the yeah to show yourself clearly that that's a your. Okay, the next letter, Z, you should probably circle because it's maybe the, just the hardest letter to write. Just the, the letter itself is very unusual and may take the most practice of any letter in the alphabet today. So um, you can peek ahead to page uh, 18 and you'll see that you can think of this in, in three steps. Uh, the first one looks like this. The second one looks like this. And the third looks like this, right? Um, so we start at the top. We reach down and come backwards and loop back over towards the middle and come to the top. That's kind of step one. And the second step that I well remember when I was learning to write this, this is kind of the, I knew I had to get through this rather, <laughs> this, this rite of passage, right? The second step is simply a straight line. In some ways, that was the most confusing thing because you want to start doing some squiggling or whatever, looping, just one straight line straight down. Okay, and then that's step two. Then step three is a mirror image of step one. All right, so you come up, make a loop back, come down, and loop back up, and you're ready if needed to connect to the following letter. So for this letter, the uppercase and the lowercase look exactly the same. So I'll just write this out a few more times so you can follow the, um, the pattern. Okay, so be sure and practice that one. Uh, next letter is Z and looks in the uppercase like a backwards, well, like a three, like a three essentially. And lowercase looks like an English cursive uh, Z as well. So this is actually probably not too difficult. Uh, looks like that. Right. And hopefully visually you can see it looks kind of like that three as well. Right. It really looks much like the printed version of that letter if we use our imagination a bit. Uh, next letter is E and that looks just like an English U. Right, so pretty easy to write. Um, e kratke, we know already, right? We just make a big E, same shape, and then come back and put the hat atop it, and that gives us our e kratke. Okay, next letter is ka. This can also be a bit of trouble. Um, the, the uppercase looks something like this. And pay attention especially to the lowercase because this is a case where you, an instance where you get some interference from English cursive where a ka looks like that with the, it goes all the way to the top of the, the row, right? But Russian ka, as is the case with so many of these lowercase letters, it's entirely confined to the lower um, half of the row. And that's a really important principle generally that it's maybe time to, to look at now, right? That so many of these lowercase letters like the je we just saw, that they're confined entirely to that middle, the, the, the lower half of the row. And so we can see certain exceptions, like we just learned z, right? It loops all the way down. So there are cases where it'll dip far below the midline or maybe come up to the top of the line. But um, 
In a lot of cases, even where in English we would expect the K to rise all the way to the top of the row, in Russian it doesn't do that. So um, you want to write it like that and make sure that it's confined to the lower half of the row. Um, now this, in the guide here, I, I list that as two strokes. It really can be written in one stroke. It kind of depends on how you like to do it, right? You could start out by writing that and then picking up your pen and starting a completely new stroke, which may be good at first, right? It may be a little bit easier to write it that way. Or you can simply come up and kind of retrace your steps and go like that, and you arrive at pretty much the same shape. Um, so nowadays I write, I write the lowercase k in one stroke, um, even though in the guide it recommends using two. Okay, what about the L? Uh, well, it's quite easy. Like that. Pay attention to the pointed little peak there, right? It's not a loop or a, uh, it's just a, a sharp point on the L. Okay, next letter is M. Now, we might be tempted to write this as the lowercase m, but we, as we've already seen, that's the Russian t, right? So the m in cursive really looks a lot like the um, printed version of m, right? It looks like this in uppercase and same shape in lowercase, right? So uh, that's another one you might want to circle. The following letter, n, of course, looks like an h, but look at the lowercase, it looks really like an, a small version of an English uppercase H, right? So we have to resist, we might feel like writing a English lowercase, lowercase H, but this is what we want. Okay, so how do we write this? Well, start like this, then come over more or less in a straight horizontal line. That's kind of the trick to writing this properly. You don't want to do something like that, right? You want to keep that middle uh, bar you know, more or less horizontal, and that will produce a good Russian N. All right, so one more time, uppercase like this or something, and then lowercase is just a small version of that exact same shape. Uh, next letter, O is easy. Looks just like English, right? Quite easy. Uh, pa, well, first one looks like an overgrown pie, right? Three strokes. And lowercase looks like an English N, right, with two humps. I'll be calling this little shape a, a hump, right? Um, and compare, compare that to a sharp peak like we had with L, right? So lowercase p, p, the P in Russian looks like an English N, and for that reason, you probably want to circle that, right? Very confusing at first. Um, but again, don't be... Um, scared off by it. I think just after writing out a few words with lowercase p, you'll get very used to this very quickly. Okay, next letter is er. So let's again confuse the, the p and the er, because of course the Russian er looks more or less like a p, right? So uppercase looks something like this, and lowercase looks like this. Okay, here's a very important point. You would probably want to circle this letter as well. And note that, note the gap at the bottom of that letter, right? So we're not writing a, an English lowercase p where we completely close off this loop, right? And end up with a circle. <clears throat> we leave the bottom completely wide open <clears throat> like this. <clears throat> okay, so you might want to practice that letter several times. Next letter is... Uh, S, which is easy, it looks like an English C, no problem. Okay, next letter is T. We know already that the lowercase is a bit confusing. Uppercase two is, you know, not like this, as we might expect. Most Russians will write that as three vertical bars and then a hat above the top, and that's our uppercase T. Lowercase T looks just like English M. And because of the interference, you might want to circle that letter, right? Remember that the stroke above the lowercase t is purely optional. 
And you may note that I haven't included it in the, on the table because I don't use it, and I think most people don't. Uh, most Russians, I think, would not do that, at least anymore. So for that reason, I think um, you shouldn't insist on doing it, but if you like doing it, if it helps, why not? It's perfectly acceptable. Okay, what about the ooh? Um, uppercase looks something like that. Lowercase looks like an English Y. Right, so as we might expect, looks like an English Y. No real problem there. Next letter is uh, F. Uh, uppercase comes in two strokes, right? First one is that, is that, right? That's our starting point. And now in the following stroke, we just want to go like this, right? You could really do it in three strokes if you wanted, right? But the point is, get this shape established. Then make one circle, one loop, and then a second one. There's your uppercase, fa. Lowercase can be done all in one stroke. Right, so if we're, we were connecting this, you see we, we can start here, make one loop, make a straight line, come back, and then join from the bottom. Join the following letter from the bottom. That too may take a bit of practice, so you might want to circle that letter as well. Next one is cha, and we noticed noted already that uh, one way to write this letter is like that, in two separate strokes, like two English C's with their back to each other. And some Russians will write the lowercase in the, in the exact same way. But again, I didn't learn to do it that way, so that's not how I teach it. I teach it as two strokes. First, we write the little squiggle, which looks exactly like a g, more or less. And then when we're done writing out the entire word, we would come back and add that cross stroke to finish our ch, our ch. Okay, next letter is the tz. Looks essentially like a big E, but then we want to add our little tail at the bottom, right? That little tail, like in the printed um, form of the letter. So the main thing here is to keep it uh, modestly sized, right? Some people will write the, this and they'll make this huge tail at the end of the letter, which looks almost like the loop on a, on a lowercase y or something like that, right? Well, this, this uh, lower loop on a y is very different from this uh, very tight little loop we want to use to make the tail on the letter tz. Right, so as long as we keep that scale uh, more or less the proportions correct, it's not particularly hard to write. And we can connect the following letter from the bottom. Right after we've made our tail, we can come up and uh, make a following letter. Uh, next letter, the ch. Pretty easy in the uppercase. Lowercase looks like that or something to that effect. There are a few bit, bit variations on the letter ch, especially lowercase, uh, but something like this. Now, this may look a little bit like an M, and we're going to talk in a moment about how those two letters are clearly differentiated in the actual, uh, in the flow of an actual word. So more on that in just a moment. Now, let's get the sh. We've talked about that already. Very easy to write. The Line beneath is optional, but highly recommended. And same thing for lowercase. Very easy to write. Now for the sh, the double length consonant, the same thing, but we want to make the nice little tail there, nice and compact. And remember, it's incorrect to write that stroke beneath this letter. That's one thing that helps can help differentiate the two. Now lowercase, same thing. Just make a very tight little tail at the end of the letter. Now the next three letters you see are completely confined to the lower half of the bar and they don't have real uppercase forms because they would never begin a word. Um, so uh, the let's start with the soft sign actually. The soft sign is like that and the hard sign has the little, I would call this also a hat. Right Now remember for the time being we're not going to be seeing the hard sign very much at all so you can almost uh, you know, we'll revisit how to write that, I think, when we when we start really using it. Um, so just note the difference here. And um, 
remember the stop sign can join to a preceding letter, but not to the following letter. There's no dotted line coming off that stop sign uh, because it can't join to the following letter. And again, we know why, because to write the cursive version of U, we basically make a stop sign shape, but then we go like this, right? And there's our completed U. So you can see that if we're writing a true soft side and then insisted on joining it somehow to the following letter, we're going to very easily arrive at a shape that looks like U. And that's why we should try never to co uh, connect the soft sign to a following letter. Okay, next letter is A. Uh, Very easy to write. Note that it doesn't connect to any letter, either before or after. And also, you might want to take a moment to circle this letter and note that, of course, it's very different from yeah. And everyone can see that clearly, but again, it's very easy to forget that. The letter a eh is not a, eh, right? Not yeah. The a eh is relatively infrequent, right? We'll be seeing a lot more of yeah than a. Eh. And for that reason, people tend to forget first of all, that this letter even exists, uh, much less how to write it, right? But it's very easy to write, very easy. Okay, last two letters, <coughs> U, and these are maybe a bit tricky because they're unfamiliar. U, uppercase would look something like that, and lowercase a bit less ornately, something like this, right? So your first stroke, then connect, and then you're basically writing a, a, a cursive or, right? Just one bar here, and then joining it to what looks like an or. Okay, final letter is the ya. Looks like a backwards uppercase R. Now, this can be tricky, so you would probably want to circle it for sure. It just seems kind of backwards, obviously. You want to start with the down here and come up like that. That's the, the start. And then kind of the trick, and I still remember learning how to write this, you have to kind of come over at a 90 degree angle, right? A sharp angle, and then complete it like this, right? So I'll do a few more. Okay, so you're look, you're, you want something more or less like this. Now, the less careful you are about this, the tendency is to, instead of making kind of a sharp, a right angle right here, to sort of make more of a loop, right? Which is usually fine, right? Usually something like this is clearly identifiable as a ya yeah, um, on one condition, right? And we're going to talk about that in one moment. So hold that thought. If you look at the next page, um, just a few little details that you want to pay extra attention to. The first one is mining the midline, right? And that just means that if we imagine a piece of, you know, handwriting paper with the guides, you may remember from elementary school, right? Um, you want to make sure, for example, that, um, you know, certain letters like the je, right? They need to be confined to that lower half, the lower um, half of the bar. Uh, but if you have a, a letter like a Y, then of course it extends all the way down here. Or an F, right, also extends beneath the baseline, right? So just watch for those proportions. And um, if you look at the text, you see uh, an example of a word that's been um, written in a way that doesn't, uh, you know, mind these guidelines, right? So the word for ring is kalsor. Right, and if we imposed some guidelines on it, we could see that every letter in the word is confined to the lower half of the the uh, the row. Only exception is the little, the very tiny little uh, tail on the tz called tso. Now, if we write that same word and we make a big uppercase ka, or you know, I'm sorry, an English lowercase k. And then we write the O, and then we write the Russian L going all the way up here, and then a soft sign, and then maybe we write the T with a big tail going all the way down, like a Y, and then something like this. Well, now it looks really very far from uh, the way it should be written in Russian, right? So 
you want to definitely mind these invisible guidelines. And um, you know, it might be fun actually to go to go to a store and buy some some of this old-fashioned paper with the guidelines, and even using that for practice if it helps at first. Okay, next we come to a really really important point. This is probably the most important detail and the most uh, frequently violated rule uh, when students are learning to write cursive. And again, it's so important because if it's violated, it almost always affects legibility, sometimes drastically. We're talking about the hooks on three letters. If you look back at the reference uh, guide and uh, you look carefully at the letters, uh, L, M, and Y, you'll see a little circle right here at the very beginning of the letters, right? So that circle in the on the table is warning you to pay attention to this hook. You'll see that each of these three letters, and it's only these three, begin begins with a, a hook like that. And I'll just go ahead and write out the letters one more time. L, M, yeah. Okay, so this is the beginning of the letter when it's not joined to anything previously, right? At the word initial position, for example, that's how you'd start the, the letter. Uh, but what if it were joined to a preceding letter? Let's imagine, for example, an ah. Okay, let's, we've just written out an ah, more or less independently. Now we want to write an L after it. We're going to write it like this. Right? We're going to write it in a way that preserves this initial hook. And that's what's helping us spot that as an L, right? that hook. That's re that really is part of the letter itself. So we can never uh, sort of smooth that out. And, um, you know, like this, for example, that's incorrect. OK, let's do the same thing with um, M. Let's write ah, M, that combination. Well, let's go ahead and just write out an ah, a standalone ah. Okay, now we want to add an M. We're going to start in such a way that preserves the hook. Right? And there it is, very visible there. That's the correct um, way to join those two letters. Last example, let's make an A-Y-A. Ah, ah, there's our complete A. Ah. And then the following letter, again, we need to maintain this hook. And that's what we write. Again, the hook is clearly visible right there. Okay, why is that so important? Let me gain a bit more real estate here. <clears throat> the reason it's so important, and especially imagine if you're writing at a more or less normal speed. Let's say you've been doing this for a couple of months and you don't, you're not just painstakingly making every last letter with it with you know a complete perfection. Well, and let's say we 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 fail to maintain the hook in these combinations. Chances are we're going to get something like this. Okay, so this could be read, again, especially if we don't take care to make the pointed uh, tip, it can look like an ah, yeah, right? It, it can very easily just look like that, which looks like ah, yeah. Um, now, by the way, if we continued even further, it could look like any number of other things as well, right? So. Uh, it just really depends on the on the particular letter combination. Okay, this can very easily and already it really looks like an ah, uh, ch, right? See that shape? It looks more like the ch than the m that it was supposed to be. Finally, this one. And note, I took I purposely wrote the ya in a rather hurried way, which people often do, especially at the end of a word. It really looks more like just a simple loop quite often. Okay, and if we do that, this now looks like a yeah, ah, uh, yeah, right? It looks very different from ah, uh, yeah. Again, even if we wrote this yeah in a rather hurried fashion, as long as we keep the hook there, it's clearly discernible as ah, uh, yeah, right? Again, so the most important thing is the hook, not necessarily that we sit here and painstakingly write out the yeah with, with great clarity. So the hooks on those three letters are really important. Now let me show you an example of sort of hypercorrection. If 
people get so used to this rule that they think that when let's write a um let's write the word yama which means a parrot and um so you, here we have an initial ya and so what students often do is they write it like that right they sort of hyper correct and they make this kind of double hook here at the beginning now of course this element here would only be present if you know it were part of a previous letter that had been joined to the ya right so if you have a standalone ya you you never write it like that right that's just an example of again hyper correction um so let's write our initial ya like that okay now we're finished writing our ya but the following letter m is also going to require a hook right so we need to make sure and make that clear right here and then final letter is an a ah that joins effortlessly to the m like that okay i'll write out a few of the examples in the uh, text there let's write the word uh, um first i'll print it Here it is, um, right there is our hook. All right, so we can imagine writing the Y first, as though it were going to stand alone. And then we start our M, making sure to maintain that initial hook. Um, okay, let's do one more. Let's write the word for pity, which is, I'll just print it out at first, jaj. Okay, look for the hook, it's right here. Right there's our j a l soft sign. Okay, uh, one more item, 4.7. Uh, let's look for a moment at these, at what I call humps. Right, just think of like the hump on a camel's back, right? It looks something like this, right? Like the letter P has, we could say two humps. The letter K, lowercase, has one, two, three of these rounded curves at the top sort of like a camel's humps, right? And just look over these letters that involve a hump, right? The pe, the te, uh, and also the n, right? You see that you begin an initial Russian n initially with a curved um, hump, right? Not a sharp angular um, point like that, right? So that's true of several letters like uh, the Russian ka, Again, the Russian M, right? They start with this smooth uh, curve at the at the beginning. Um, okay, finally, let's look at page nineteen, and I'll write out some of these words so you can see the the way my pen is flowing, the way the letters are connected. Of course, you can see examples in the textbook itself. But let's start with the word uh, city, Gorod, Gorod. Gorod. Next is Fraza. Okay, I'll point out things you want to definitely just double check. Here it's the gap in the letter R. Fraza. Fraza. Next is Kniga. Kniga. Okay, you might want to distinguish the ge right there, right? That little backwards S, that little squiggle, that's your lowercase ge. Next word for meaning poetry is stihi, stihi. Okay, we've got a cha, so we know we're going to have to write out the body of the word, then come make the cross stroke. Okay, there's our starting point. Now we come back and add the cross stroke to complete the uh, X, so to speak. Okay, the word Nigelia. Here we have the L and the Ya. We've got to always watch out for those. They're going to require the initial hook. Okay, so watch the D, right? The Nigelia looks like a G in English, G. And here's our L with the hook. Here's our Ya with the hook as well. Nigelia. 
Uh, next word, skaska, fairy tale. Skaska. Next word we've already written, I think, before, bashoi, bashoi. Okay, note the initial, the, the bay, right? It's not going to join to anything uh, following. Now we've just written an or, and we've realized, well, the L is going to start down here, so there's no easy way to join those two letters. Now we've written our L soft sign, and we remember that the soft sign can't join to, the, to a following letter, so we, we're going to pick up our pen, and here's, we can sort of pause halfway through this word, bald, uh, bald. By the way, this is already a word, boj, meaning pain, right? So this is a word for pain. But we're writing bar shui, so now we're going to finish the word. And two things we can do, right? We have to add the hat to the kratke, and we can come back and write the stroke beneath the sh to make it more easily recognizable. Okay, next word, journal, meaning magazine. Journal, journal. Next word, kanyets, meaning the ending, the end. Okay, main thing here is the N. Make sure you join the O and the N there with that nice curve, that hump. And then just make sure that you, the tail on your tse is not uh, gigantically proportioned, right? We want to make it nice and compact. Okay, next word is yojik, meaning a little hedgehog. Okay, now I want to check your je. There's the je, yojik, and again, optional, but probably advisable for first-year students. Put the two dots above the yo. Yojik. Okay, next, uh, now we have a few words here with some uh, capital letters, right? Uh, so actually, let's jump to the second column, and then we'll do the capital letters uh, at the end. Let's do lorsh, meaning falsehood. Lorsh, right? So, j and a soft sign, I should have maybe connected that a little bit better there. Lorsh. Next, paesia. Okay, note that this has an a in the middle, paesia, and that a is not going to connect to anything. So, we start by writing poor. Now comes a, doesn't connect to anything. And then we complete z ya And double check that you have a hook at the beginning of the ya, paesia, paesia. Next word, Soyuz, right, as in Soviet Union, Sovietsky Soyuz. Okay, and there's the maybe somewhat tricky letter, U, Soyuz, Soyuz. The word for language is Yazik. I didn't make that very well. I was running out of real estate. Okay, so let me write it a bit. More clearly. Okay, yuzik. So there's a better example of a z, right? Z looks like English cursive z. Yuzik, yuzik. Okay, note your initial ya. There's your hook. There's your initial position hook on the ya. Next is borsh. Okay, we start out with the ba. We don't join it to anything. Borsh. Okay, two more things to check. Did you leave a gap uh, at the bottom of your pe? Again, we're not making an English P by closing that, that loop off. And finally, make sure your tail on the sh isn't out of control. Okay, next item is koshka, cat.
Okay, there's a good chance to look at your cause, right? Make sure they're nice and compact and that this entire word, right? Here's a, one of, you know, very many examples where the entire lowercase word is confined to the lower half of the, uh, the row. Okay, next item, student, student. Okay, not too hard to write. Check the that your the looks like a, a English an English G student, and if you like, you can come back and write the bars above the test, and you can see how visually that may help you um, sound out this word a bit more easily, right? By because that crossbar again makes it look perhaps a little bit more like a printed the student student. Uh, next item is an infinitive, meaning to read. Chitach, chitach. Okay, that may look like a bit of a jumble, but again, if we come back and add the bars to the te, it becomes that much easier to read. Chitach, chitach. Next word is, is uh, zdatche, meaning change, like change at the cash register. Zdacha, zdacha. Okay, now look how there's no hook here in front of the ch. That's what's clearly distinguishing it from a, from an m. So if we take a, a word like zdam, which is related to the word zdacha, it means to give back. Um, that would look like this. There's the hook, right? So zdacha versus zdam. Okay, um, let's take the word. Bad, the feminine version, plachaya. Okay, plachaya. Now note the hook on the L. Uh, uh, note the hook on the Ya. And there's one thing we've forgotten to do so far, namely the final cross bar on the X, right? Plachaya, plachaya. Okay, let's now do a few um, uh, proper nouns with uh, that should begin with an uppercase letter, right? The names of people and cities and so forth. Um, one of my most important tips here in learning cursive is don't forget the uppercase letters. They're not optional. Um, although they're not used nearly as frequently as all the lowercase levels uh, letters, right? And that helps explain why people just forget the way they're supposed to look, especially the uppercase letters that look a bit peculiar, like the g or the t, right? People completely forget the way how they're supposed to look. So try not to do that. And it would be a great idea to come back periodically, especially the first several months, and just practice writing out all the uppercase letters one more time. When you come to writing one in an exercise, refer to the table if necessary. But remember that, you know, you, uh, for example, Sentences begin with a capital letter in Russian, just like in English, so it's not at all optional. You can't properly begin an English, a Russian sentence with a lowercase letter. Okay, so let's write a few of these. And pay attention uh, also to the fact that many of the uppercase letters don't connect anything after them. Now let's take the first one, Chekhov, the writer Chekhov. Uh, lowercase, uppercase Ch looks like this, and so we can see that's going to be, you know, logically it can connect very easily to... Uh, uh, following letter. So Chekhov will be like that. Chekhov. Chekhov. Francia. Here's our, uh, the beginning of our f, f. Now we add two loops to it and we're ready. Francia. Okay, check. Did you leave space at the bottom of the R? And is the hook visible at the beginning of the Ya? Ja, Francia. Next is Germania. Germania. Okay, and you see the hooks right here on the M and the Ya. Ja. You may notice that when I wrote a little bit 
at more of a normal pace. So sometimes these little hooks can become a little more than a little squiggle, a tiny little indentation. But once you're used to the cursive alphabet, that's still very conspicuous. It still clearly helps distinguish the, you know, the, the M and the Ya, right? Even if it's rather subtle, it's still there. Uh, Raisia. 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 Now you may notice here, here's a good example of the uppercase R, right? If we're going strictly by what's in the textbook, I have something more like this, right? Now, as you can see, it really isn't the end of the world if you make this uppercase R in a slightly different way, right? Um, you know, that is still perfectly fine, right? Either of these looks pretty much the same. So it's little details like that that really just aren't that important, uh, at least in my view. Um, it obviously does nothing to affect legibility. Um, what about America? America. Now here's another nice example. We wrote an uppercase A, uh, and we ended it up here near the midline. The next letter is an M, which starts at the baseline. So there's no good way to join those two letters, and so we don't insist on doing so. We just pick up our pen and start over at the bottom of the, uh, you know, at the baseline. Okay, almost done. Tolstoy, the author, right? So here's an uppercase T. Looks like that. Tolstoy. Tolstoy, Peterburg, uppercase P, right, which just looks like an overgrown pie. Okay, look at what we've written so far, Peter, B, right, so the B, we pause, no connection. Peterburg, Peterburg. Next is Moscow. Moskva, Moskva. Okay, two more. Yaponia. Japan is Yaponia. Okay, look at your two ya's, right? Ya, there's the uppercase, and right there's the initial hook, and here's the hook, uh, right, with uh, following the preceding letter. Yaponia. Now, I'll also check your pad. It looks like an English N, and the Russian N looks like a kind of bizarre little uh, uppercase English H. Right? Again, here's another good word, quite typical, where you see you've got the capital letter, but then all of the remaining lowercase letters are confined to that lower half of the, um, the bar. Right? So you always really want to pay attention to where those guidelines are and make sure you're not... Uh, violating them on a regular basis. It can be also very off-putting visually. Okay, last one. Let's write the, you know, the father of modern Russian literature, Alexander Pushkin. We'll learn a lot about him, by the way, once we get into book three. We'll be reading a lot of Pushkin. Um, in fact, we'll be reading the entirety of his very important narrative poem, The Bronze Horseman, in which we'll be chased through the streets of Petersburg by a um, a statue, a rather scary statue of Peter the Great. Okay, so Pushkin's name starts with a capital P. There we go, Pushkin. Okay, and if we like, we can come back and put the bar underneath the sh, and we get Pushkin. Pushkin. Okay, so that does it for today, finally, and tomorrow we'll start with our actual study of grammar. And uh, again, with the cursive, the best way to learn this is simply by doing it. Just write out words. You have a few examples here in the, um, in the textbook. Uh, and uh, refer back to the chart. Check yourself. Refer to the chart and make sure you're not violating certain things, especially these rules with the, the hooks, right? That's the most important, the most common mistake. Um, and... Uh, if you follow those, those rules and avoid obvious mistakes, then you're probably going to catch on to writing good Russian cursive within a mad, matter of two, three weeks. That's usually the, uh, the typical time period. Although often the very first worksheets I get back from students, uh, they're really writing 
rather beautiful cursive. They just have to watch out for certain mistakes they may have, certain slip-ups they may have committed. And once they iron out those mistakes, they, they're usually writing beautiful cursive by the end of the first semester. Ладно, это все на сегодня. That's all for today. Uh, до завтра, until tomorrow. До свидания. Oh